24th Sunday in Ordinary Time. A reading from the book of Exodus. The Lord said to Moses, Go down at once to your people, whom you brought out of the land of Egypt, for they have become depraved. They have soon turned aside from the way I pointed out to them, making for themselves a molten calf and worshiping it, sacrificing to it, and crying out, This is your God, O Israel, who brought you out of the land of Egypt. I see how stiff-necked this people is, continued the Lord to Moses. Let me alone then, that my wrath may blaze up against them to consume them. Then I will make of you a great nation. But Moses implored the Lord his God, saying, Why, O Lord, should your wrath blaze up against your own people, whom you brought out of the land of Egypt, with such great power and with so strong a hand? Remember your servants, Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, and how you swore to them by your own self, saying, I will make your descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky, and all this land that I promised, I will give your descendants as their perpetual heritage. So the Lord relented in the punishment he had threatened to inflict on his people. The Word of the Lord. A reading from the first letter of St. Paul to Timothy. Beloved, I am grateful to him who has strengthened me, Christ Jesus our Lord, because he considered me trustworthy in appointing me to the ministry. I was once a blasphemer and a persecutor and arrogant, but I have been mercifully treated because I acted out of ignorance in my unbelief. Indeed, the grace of our Lord has been abundant, along with the faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. This saying is trustworthy 
and deserves full acceptance. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. Of these, I am the foremost, but for that reason, I was mercifully treated, so that in me as the foremost, Christ Jesus might display all his patience as an example for those who would come to believe in him for everlasting life. To the King of ages, incorruptible, invisible, the only God, honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. The Word of the Lord. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to Luke. Tax collectors and sinners were all drawing near to listen to Jesus. But the Pharisees and scribes began to complain, saying, This man welcomes the sinners and eats with them. So to them he addressed this parable. What man among you, having a hundred sheep and losing one of them, would not leave the ninety-nine in the desert and go after the lost one until he finds it? And when he does find it, he sets it on his shoulders with great joy. And upon his arrival at home, he calls together his friends and neighbors and says to them, Rejoice with me, because I have found my lost sheep. I tell you, in just the same way, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over ninety-nine righteous people who have no need of repentance. Or what woman, having ten coins and losing one, would not light a lamp and sweep the house, searching carefully until she finds it? And when she does find it, she calls together her friends and neighbors and says to them, Rejoice with me, because I have found the coin that I lost. In just the same way, I tell you, there will be rejoicing among the angels of God over one sinner who repents. The Gospel of the Lord. The 24th Sunday in Ordinary Time. The first reading comes from the book of Exodus, chapter 32, verses 7 to 11 and 13 to 14. Moses is speaking with God on Mount Sinai, and he's received the Ten Commandments. But then God tells him to go down because the people have turned astray from his ways. They've made a golden calf, and they're worshiping it. So God threatens to destroy that people. How does Moses respond? He intercedes for the people. Even though this is the same people who have at times accused them of leading them to their death, they've been ungrateful, nevertheless Moses intercedes for them and reminds God of how he had made promises to Abraham, Isaac, and Israel by his own self, and therefore he was bound to keep those promises even if the people were unfaithful. That's a bit cheeky, reminding God of his fidelity, telling God that If he doesn't keep to his promises, then no one will trust him in the future. But that's typical of Jewish prayer in the Old Testament. They speak to God as if God were one of their friends, as if God were one of their acquaintances. They say things that we might find a bit cheeky, and we might apply the Yiddish word chutzpah to what they're doing, but they see it as simply a natural relationship. It's interesting that Moses, in spite of the fact he's persecuted by his own people, stands up for them. And what a model that is for any sort of ministry that we do. That it's not about us, it's not about what we get out of it, but rather what we can give. The second reading is from 1 Timothy 1, 12-17. The author of this letter speaks about how Paul was a blasphemer, a persecutor, and arrogant. Now I say it in that way because, remember, we don't necessarily believe that Paul wrote this letter It seems to have been written in the generation after Paul. But whoever the author was uses the pseudonym of Paul and therefore applies Paul's life to the letter. Paul's example is one of turning away from God, and yet God is merciful to him. If God is merciful to him, the greatest of sinners, how much more will God be merciful to the rest of us? And so the author of this letter celebrates the fact that God is so much greater than we can understand, especially in his mercy. We see that mercy again in the Gospel, Luke 15, verses 1 to 32. 
It begins with a parable. If a man had a hundred sheep and lost one, wouldn't he go after that one lost sheep? And when he found it, wouldn't he rejoice? Typical of Luke's Gospel, it then gives a woman's example. If a woman had ten coins and lost one, wouldn't she sweep the house and when she found it, celebrate with her neighbors? And then it gives a parable about the prodigal son. Now, traditionally, this parable is called the prodigal son, but some people have argued the better title for it would be the prodigal father, because the word prodigal doesn't mean lost, doesn't mean sinner. It means somebody who's very generous. And in fact, isn't the father generous with his mercy? He has two sons, the youngest of whom asks for his inheritance. Now, just by saying that, one receives one's inheritance when somebody dies. So he's effectively saying to his father, I wish you were dead. The father goes along with it. The young boy goes and squanders his inheritance on loose living. When he's poor, when he's starving, when he's forced to feed pigs on someone else's farm, he realizes that his father's servants have it much better off than he does. So he's going to go back to his father and apologize. Now, it's not at all clear that he's really sorry for what he's done. In fact, he might be apologizing just to get a mouthful of food, just to get forgiven by the father. Sort of like a teenager who says, what do I have to do to get forgiven? And when he comes back, in fact, the father's waiting for him. Now, if the father were a normal Jewish father, he would have had the son killed. That's what Deuteronomy says. And even if he didn't do that, he would be waiting in the house until his son came kowtowing to him. This father shows incredible compassion, waiting on the hillside for his son to come back. And when his son comes back, he forgives him even before the son says a word, because he knows it's just a line. The son will say whatever he has to, to get forgiven. He treats him as a long-lost son, and he throws a celebration for him, which really ticks off the older brother. And the older brother complains because he's always been serving the father, and he never received so much as a kid goat. Notice, his motivation is not all that different from that of a son. He was there to see what he could get out of his father. He just didn't have the courage to ask for it immediately. He was waiting for the father to die. And is that really any better than what the younger son did? The father says, we had to rejoice because your brother was dead and now he's returned. That emphasis upon we had to rejoice, that this is only natural because your brother was in a terrible position and now he's alive again. And that is the way that God rejoices over the sinner who returns. And that should also be the way that we rejoice over those who turn back from their evil ways and choose to follow God. And may God bless us.